honest evaluation of who we are. And it changes us for the better. He had a great reputation, Balaam did. Clark's commentary almost paints him as a pretty good guy. But I parallel him with Simon the sorcerer. What do you know about Simon the sorcerer in chapter 8 of Acts? He was in the gall of bitterness when he wanted what? He wanted to what? Let me buy the Holy Spirit from you. He was referred to as a great one. If you look in commentaries a lot of time, his name will be Simon Magnus. You know what that word means? Great. Magus means big. He's a big dude. He had them all wrapped around his finger. Balaam likes that reputation, but he also likes the money. He, Simon the sorcerer referred to as a great one. Let's continue reading. Verse 20. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If, uh-oh, what is if? It's a contingency statement. If this, then that. God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to call you, rise and go with them, but only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. Now notice the very next sentence. So Balaam rose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. Did they come call him? You can read commentaries, whatever. I don't know that they came to call Balaam. He was in a hurry. And he wanted to go. He was going to speak God's Word because God was going to put the Word in his mouth. Just like he put the Word in the donkey's mouth. But Balaam was in a hurry to go because maybe he'll change his mind. Maybe he'll let me get this. Maybe he'll let me have this money. Maybe I'll keep my reputation. Doug. Probably. How often do we do those same kind of things? Oh, they'll be here in just a minute. Well, they're not here yet. I'll just get ready and go. God said, if they call you, then you can go. Don't you take away from God's Word and don't you add to it. Turn with me to Revelation 22. You know the passage. Revelation 22, beginning in verse 18. The American Standard reads this way. I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto them... God shall add unto him the plagues which are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city which are written in this book. Is it a big deal if you don't tell all God says? And if you leave out things that God has said, it's a big deal. This is serious. Celine Dion had a song, whatever she's well known from many of us. And her song was basically words of it. 
Baby, this is serious. This is serious. Are you thinking about you or us? Think twice before you roll those dice. This is serious. This is serious business when we study, when we comprehend God's Word. Don't leave it out and don't add to it. What's another reason that Balaam just didn't tell all that God said to begin with? Well, there's another country song that Jeannie Freaky had. And here's the one-liner. Your heart's not in it. I know it was a crazy country song and it dealt with all kinds of crazy stuff and whatever. But the line... Those are the one lines that always get me and hit me. Your heart's not in it. What's the great commandment? The greatest commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. I wonder why you put heart first. With all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Mark it's with all thy strength. Do you have anything left when you do that? How much have you given God when you love Him with all your heart? That's first. This comprises everything. It comprises your intellect. It comprises your will. It comprises your emotions. That is the biblical heart. Balaam, his heart's not in it. He wants the prestige and he wants the money. So he tries not to tell all that God said and he doesn't. He didn't say, God refuses to let me go. They are blessed. That's it. Final. Over. Leave me alone. The answer is no. What part of no don't you understand? Well, Balaam told more than God said. If you continue reading chapters 23, 24, and 25, Balaam's name's not in chapter 25, but the matter of Peor is. Now notice... If you look at Numbers 31, go to Numbers 31. I want to read to you, just I try to read kind of fast, whatever, but I want you to get the point of this. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, this is chapter 31, I'm reading from American Standard of 1901. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites. Remember who Moab joined themselves to? The Midianites. Afterwards shalt thou be gathered unto thy people. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm ye, arm ye men from among you for the war, that they may go against Midian to execute Jehovah's vengeance on Midian. Of every tribe a thousand throughout all the tribes of Israel shall ye send to the war. So they were delivered out of thousands of Israel, a thousand of every tribe, twelve thousand armed for war. And Moses sent them a thousand of every tribe to the war. Them and Phineas, the son of Eliezer. Phineas is kind of a neat name. The priests to the war with the vessels of the sanctuary and the trumpets for the alarm in his hand. And they warred against Midian as Jehovah commanded Moses and they slew every male and they slew the kings of Midian with the rest of their slain, Evi and Recham and Zer and Hur and Reba and the five kings of Midian. Balaam, also the son of Beor, they slew with the sword. 
And the children of Israel took captive the women of Midian and their little ones and all their cattle and all their flocks and all their goods they took for a prey. And all their cities and the places wherein they dwelt and all their encampments they burned with fire. And they took all the spoil and all the prey, both of man and of beast. And they brought the captives and the prey and the spoil unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the congregation of the children of Israel unto the camp at the plains of Moab, which are by the Jordan at Jericho. And Moses and Eleazar the priest and all the princes of the congregation went forth to meet them without the camp. And Moses with wrath. Moses was wroth. What does that mean? He was angry. He was plenty mad. Well, why? They just went and destroyed him. Notice what happens though. And Moses with wrath with the officers of the host, the captains of thousands and the captains of hundreds who came from the service of the war. And Moses said unto them, Have ye saved all the women alive? Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against Jehovah in the matter of Peor. And so the plague was among the congregation of Jehovah. Did you do what God told you to do? Nope. We thought we'd bring back, just like Saul, we're going to bring back the best. The people convinced me to do it. We're going to bring back the best. Rebellion is, is a sin of witchcraft. And if you want to really know about witchcraft and what God thought about it, you need to go to Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, and read that section. It's the same section that tells that God's going to raise up a prophet like unto Moses. But before he says that, he tells them about witchcraft and divining and sorcery and everything else, just like Galatians 5, 20 list witchcraft as one of the sins of the flesh. And God's hatred for it. They didn't. They didn't do what God said to do. And way back when this took place, the plague set in and 24,000 of them died. Now I know Paul says 23,000 in 1 Corinthians 10, but you need to read probably, how many of you bought this Bible from Apologetics Press? There's a whole section in here about Balaam, about the donkey, there's a whole section in here. How many pages that you'll read when you read through this that talk about, you know, contradictions? The Bible doesn't contradict itself. You read that passage where Paul says 23,000. But the key was in one day, 24,000 died from the plague because they didn't do what God said do. They left out a little bit. Well, we did most of it. Did you do all of it? Did you take God at His Word? Does it matter what a church teaches? You know the reason for this lesson? My soul and the souls of the world all oh depend on us teaching all of God's Word, not adding to it, not leaving anything out. This may sound like a real hard passage to you, but I want you to go to 2 John. Second John you'll pick up with me in verse 7. I'll read from the New King James this time. 2 John, beginning at verse 7. For many, 
For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves. Look in the mirror, the mirror of God's Word. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we work for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses, the American standard translate. It's the word transgresses as goes beyond. Whoever goes beyond, whoever goes on and goes ahead, if they call you, well, they're not getting here fast enough. I'm going to saddle my donkey and get on it. I got to get with it. Whoever goes beyond and transgresses, well, transgresses there, if you look at that word, it's a combined form of the word, whatever. Not that I know anything about it, but I can call it up on my pocket sword. And it's a compound word. And it means near. Right beside of. And the last part of that word, I don't know what it's a preposition, what it means to stand. Are we standing? It basically means your foot... Are you standing on solid ground? My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest rain, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. But here's where we go. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine, the American standard will say teaching. Does it matter what a church teaches? Whoever does not abide, stand on God's Word, does not have God. I mean, that's pretty plain. If a church doesn't teach all of God's Word, your faith is on shift and sand. He who abides in the doctrine, he who abides in the teaching of Christ, has both the Father and the Son. If anyone, contingency, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, this teaching, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. Now, I'm not telling you you have to tell the Mormons you can't come in my house. If you're willing to sit down and study the Bible, you don't need the Book of Mormon. You know, or you came up with it from divination, you know, look at them stones in that hat or whatever. You need the Bible. You need all of the Bible. And you don't need more than the Bible. I'm not telling you not to study with them. I'm not telling you. God's not telling you. They need the truth. They need the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And we need to stand up and give the truth. We don't need to be arrogant and mean about it. We need to be humble. We need to know where we've come from and how God has spared us. Well, What's the purpose of this lesson? And hopefully you've got it by now. We need to teach it all. Well, 2 Corinthians 2, 17, when I mentioned to you in that passage, the American standard says not corrupting the Word of God. Not corrupting the Word of God. The King James, New King James will say peddling. 
And Alan will probably point out to you exactly what that meant. They watered it down. No. No, you don't peddle God's Word. You tell the truth. You tell it kindly. You tell it sincerely. But you don't back away from telling the truth. You don't add to and you don't take away from God's Word. How did Balaam die? We've already gone over that. But how did Balaam die? He died by the sword. If you'll go back and you'll read the prophecies that he gave out, he basically said that he wanted to die like Israel. He said this, he said, let me die the death of the righteous. Let me die the death of the righteous. Good advice, but how do you do that? What's Revelation 2.10 say? Be thou, me. Can't worry about you right now. Be thou faithful unto even in. Be thou faithful even in death. And who will give the crown of life? God will. I hope you see the point of this lesson. Your assignment for next week is this. Ask yourself this question. Do I know God? Do I really know God? I know Frank Bohannon's basically got lessons that he wants to teach on the characteristics of God. But ask yourself this question. Do I know God? Read Acts 17, and that will be our lesson text for next week. Acts 17, you know the passage. And that'll be our lesson text for next week. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate your attention and kind attention.